going through and scrolling through uh, the amazing questions that we definitely want people um, to continue to uh, put into the chat. Perhaps we um, ask a broad question for the panelists overall to engage that I think also captures um, some of the early questions that have gone into the Q&A um, and into the chat. And that's really about us thinking about the uh, 2020 um, election. You all have uh, done such a magnificent job in terms of thinking about the importance of the intersection of race and gender. Um, as a scholar in that area, I can't say how much my heart is warm to see so much um, growing scholarship um, in this area. Um, but in particular, we also want to contextualize as the panel title talks about, we are thinking about voter turnout in the midst of a pandemic. Right, And you all have all talked us through uh, mobilization incentives, and you also have talked us through um, historic mobilization on the part of organizations. You've talked to us um, about ba key battleground states that we need to pay attention to. But what happens in the midst of a pandemic where we're thinking about voter turnout? Can you talk about um, the significance of the backdrop of of the pandemic for all of the kinds of mobilizations that we've been talking about and for all, in particular talking about the various groups in particular um, gender groups um, that we are uplifting in terms of what the pandemic means for uh, black voter turnout and black gender black gender dynamics thank you I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, just with from what I have seen and looking at how these organizations are mobilizing, I think that the issue of the pandemic really, I think, centered what these organizations were saying around voter education and having a plan. And I think that plan really is around voter, you know, responding to voter suppression, but having people really think consciously about their decision, how are they going to do this? Um, and so I think Black voters have for months thought about how am I going to do this? I want to vote. Am I mailing in a ballot? And I think a lot of people initially went that direction over the last few weeks. Some people have not. We've seen, and I believe it was in Philadelphia, where there were actually op 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 plannings where people could actually turn in their ballots so they could vote in person because they were concerned about the efforts in the uh, Pennsylvania legislature to um, pretty much tamper with vote counting. Um, and so I think it, it has made people more deliberate in the decisions. I think there is some concern, particularly around older voters. Um, so when we're talking about black women and turnout, a lot of those voters are our elders. Um, so I think we have to now be at a phase now where people have not submitted absentee ballot. How do we get these voters safely to the poll and get them back home? So I think that has to be the second part of this phase. I haven't seen that yet. Maybe some of you have, but I'm, I'm hoping to see that those are some conversations about the people who are going to show up. But I think we are encouraged um, just this week, the early voting began in South Carolina and to see the lines of people that were spaced out. You know, they were very, people masked, but they were standing in line wrapped around those buildings. So I think people are committed to showing up, but I think the second phase of this now has to be those that are showing up, how do we get them there safely um, and, and inform them of ways to get them safe if they have not done the absentee ballot process. Todd, you're getting in there. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I'm curious as to um, when we think about this as an aspect of African American political history, um, and um, you know that there's you know much work we can draw upon this in, the, in that regard. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering about the ways in which the current pandemic is having an impact upon African American social networks, um, and as we use that word, social capital, right? Um, and so what does it mean for African-American churches to have to meet on the church parking lot in order to have, have services or do it over, over Facebook and the internet? Um, and, or, or for um, African-American, you know, we, we often talk about you know, African-American barbershops and duty shops and salons, the sort of these important social uh, places of social discourse. Um, again, referencing work, I know that of individuals who are on this, on the, in the audience. 
But um, the, the, you know, thinking about the ways in which um, th there is this sort of public discourse uh, that, that, um, that has always been integral to African-American, you know, thinking, uh, mobilization, social norms, uh, that, that it, in what ways is it taking place? And so I'm, I'm wondering if social media or, or the adaptations to these spaces enough. Um, and it, are we going to see, I mean, I think there are ways in which we're spending more time at home. So we're, we're plugged in ways we haven't. Very anecdotally, my, my 88 year old, uh, well, she, she, she would have gotten on me from saying her age, but my mother <laughs> is now connected on the internet in ways she wouldn't have been. Um, and so, yes, she can connect to her church to, in other ways, but at the same time, it's not, is it the same? And so that's one concern I have um, as to those factors that may help to mobilize, um, are they there? Lori, is that your? Sure. Well, I, I want to echo, let me make sure my mic is on. I want to echo Pearl and Todd because we do have a long historical context of grassroots organizing, get out the vote, GOTV forms of uh, mobilization. And the Black church has been front and center of that, as well as this kinds of civic organizations, the Divine Nine and others that Pearl notes. I really worry about the impact of the pandemic on African Americans, especially our elders and those more seasoned voters. I also worry about the distrust among Black voters in the mail-in process, the extent to which their vote will count if they do not take that journey towards the polls um, with packing a lunch and bringing a yard chair to sit out and, um, and engage in their civic duty. And it is a part of the the ethos of the of the Black experience to um, engage in that day. Um, I worry about um, Black women canvassers, Black women poll workers and their safety, particularly in light of the stand back and stand by. I wonder about the extent to which um, our secretaries of state and our, um, our, our county registrars are vigilant and aware of some of these fears of both distrust among Black voters, but also in, in terms of protecting poll workers and canvassers. I truly believe that Black women will show up and show out like they always do. But that still doesn't mean that it didn't give me pause to hear um, Trump um, make those claims uh, or make that statement about stand back and, and stand by. And I wonder about the extent to which it affected Black women somehow differently um, when we think about um, verbal um, um, or either other acts of, of, of violence um, that we, we, we know about through our history, through narrative, um, through the sharing of stories um, among our elders and others who've taught us or, and had us learn the ways of, how, of what we've been through in order to um, gain freedom and the access to the vote. One quick thing that I wanted to say about, and uh, this has been noted in the in the, um, in the questions and in the comments is the extent to which um, voter turnout surpassed whites um, in 2012 and black women's voter turnout surpassed that of any other racial and ethnic group in 2008 and 2012. And then the 7% drop in voter turnout um, everybody went crazy about the extent to which, you know, black, black folks, especially, particularly black women, didn't show up in the ways that they should have. But as um, Ishmael White and Cheryl Laird and so many others have pointed out, we really do need to look and compare to um, black voter turnout in 2008. Because in fact, in 2016, black voter turnout we went right back to the same rates as they did in 2004. So we have to instead look at the cycles of under mobilization for black voters. So rather than preparing the narrative around blaming black voters, the 18 to 34 who may or may not be as enthusiastic and our elder voter, elders who are afraid or have mistrust in the political process, the mobilization needs to happen right now for those groups to make sure that they understand um, how to get things done. It's not where whether or not they want to do it, um, or whether or not they have agency, but making sure that they're, they feel secure in the process. And again, um, comparing back to 2004, we, we should learn some lessons about the stakes of under mobilization of the Black electorate. Can I just say something real quick, Lori? So I participated in a um, poll workers training last week, and it was the Black women that were raising the question of security, particularly with um, the opportunity for 
people to actually observe? Like what were the guidelines about observation? Um, who actually can come in? So it was the black women that I noticed that were really adamant and pushed the trainer to really commit to, you know, where's the security? Will the police be, um, you know, going around the polls? Um, so that is something that um, I think those of us who have volunteered to do that um, is conscious. But as to your point, it's not that we don't have the commitment. It's just we are very conscious of our safety. But we also, I think, to what my earlier point was about the community piece, we're there because we're concerned about the community. And so that's part of the mindset of Black women is why we're doing what we're doing is that it is the community that I may be in harm's way, but I want to ensure that my grandmother, my aunt, uncles, that they can have the right to vote too. Thank you. Um, Kanisha? Something Dr. Fraser said uh, reminded me of a question in the Q&A, which is about whether Black institutions have changed as Re return migration happens. And so I think that is really critically important to continue to say out loud to Democrats, and anybody else that will listen that you have to actually campaign to black people, uh, that we have black girl magic, but we're not actually magic, that it's a phrase uh, that we use to celebrate ourselves. And so I think that to answer the question about whether the organizations and the social networks in the Midwest and in the North have changed and whether that changes the way we do politics, I think it's a both and. I think we know that one of the things that happened in the Great Migration was that as people moved, it was also the case that their movement changed the, the nature of churches, changed the nature of access to medical care, changed the nature of their civic organizations. And so I would imagine, I'm not finished studying yet, uh, but I would imagine that the same thing is happening in these Midwestern places where as people move, they take that social capital with them. But I wanna say again, that I don't think it's just that that I think it's important for Democrats to campaign to Black people if they expect that Black people will come out and, and not to assume that it's a thing that happens automatically. Excellent. Uh, Tiffany, did you wanna take one of the questions from the Q&A? Yeah, I did actually. So um, there's a question and I'm not going in in proper order because we've actually addressed some of the chat questions and some of the Q&A questions. Um, and I know that there's a couple of people, um, Dr. McCormick and Dr. Penderhughes that also have uh, questions, but I'm gonna go with this one from Tiana Masakoy. Thank you so much for your time and research. Do we see any implications from Breonna Taylor, the lack of justice and the issue of protecting black womanhood on the election and swinging any potential moderates regardless of race? Um, I think that's a really important question. I'd love to hear, you know, a couple of the folks respond to that one. I, I think I'll start because mine will be a bit more general than I, I assume the folks who are thinking about gender will be. I think that this outcome is important insofar as it reminds us of George Floyd. And so I don't know about y'all's world, but it seems like things happen so fast that the George Floyd protests were so long ago. And so I think that these things that happen, uh, in particular, the feedback we get from Breonna Taylor's case, is just a reminder of how we felt in that moment. And I think that those reminders will be important to move people, particularly white moderates who might be interested to move to do so when they get these reminders about her case, when they get these reminders about standing back and standing by and all of those other things, I think have a, a piece of them that cringe. And I think some of them might be willing to move on the basis of not wanting to be associated with races, even if that means that that's just the decision that they make between themselves and their ballot once they're in the ballot box. Thank you so much for that. So another question um, I wanna actually give a space to uh, Dr. McCormick. I know you've had a comment that you've had your hand up for a really long time. If you'll unmute yourself, um, then we can hear your comment. Tiffany, I believe we- Dr. Lost... McCormick should be able to talk now. Oh, okay.
Dr. McCormick, if you unmute yourself, you, we should be able to hear your question or your comment. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Go right uh, uh, since I, I'm the, the, the relic in this group, uh, I, I, I am still working through this Zoom technology, but I just wanted to compliment you for the outstanding work that has been done. Uh, this is just a, a huge leap forward in terms of electoral research that we've seen over the past 30 years, and I can't wait until the post-election analysis, which I think is gonna be very much informed by what we've seen today. Again, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. McCormick. Go ahead, Wendy. Um, so again, thank you. This is, um, I wanted to echo uh, the importance and significance of this level and caliber um, of work as well. Um, I wanted to move to um, an additional question that um, seems to uh, exist in the Q&A in various, um, various forms. And it's a question about the relatability of uh, Senator Harris, particularly for um, African-American men, if we're thinking about um, the ways in which uh, African-American male voters will be mobilized, whether or not the record um, as a prosecutor and DA um, has any impact in terms of connection, building connection with African-American male voters in particular, or depressing that uh, voter turnout and support among African-American men. And Todd, we'll start with you and we'll move around the um, Hollywood squares here. Okay, thank you. So I think actually this um, question relates uh, directly to the previous question about Breonna Taylor. Um, and I, I, I'm thinking of, of the, uh, the interesting sort of um, historical moment of, of candidate uh, Harris being on the debate stage um, as a, a former prosecutor and now US Senator and now the vice presidential um, candidate who sort of certainly um, uh, broken a, a particular barrier, and uh, but speaking to the moment of Breonna Taylor and that question about Breonna Taylor, and, and I think it was intriguing that the question was framed about the lack of justice to Breonna Taylor, of which Harris responded and and, and certainly tried to project in a um, a um, you know a record as a, pro a progressive prosecutor. Um, I, you know, I think this is a broader question around the whole, um, uh, you know, say, say her name campaign, among many others uh, that Professor Crenshaw and many others have mobilized around to raise these questions. And I've been thinking likewise about this question about how these incidences um, of, the, of, the, of the state and police violence against Black women um, have shown up. Uh, in our public consciousness and our mobilization in different and sometimes very different ways than confront uh, what we see among the, the state violence against uh, black men. Having said this, I do think that, we, uh, that we're in this extraordinary moment uh, where I'm not quite certain of, the, of the, the earlier concerns around candidate Harris's prosecutorial record um, are now the fundamental issue. Um, and that might redound to, that might be a downside in terms of the narrowing of black politics <laughs> because we're in such a, a moment around consensus. I do think it is a question, it's a fair question to actually ask what was her record and what did she pursue? Uh, and I say this, you know, in, 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 in an attempt to, to, at my scholarly objectivity, although I'm a, I'm a, I, I'm a son of Howard University and pr proud of her candidacy in other respects. But I do think there is an empirical question to ask and, and how do we think she has been able to address that more squarely? Uh, because I have done some, some research to ask that same set of questions. I, I, and, and I'm not absolutely certain that question um, is resolved, particularly among African-American men who may raise that and are they raising it because of the concern around her criminal justice, her, her record as a prosecutor, is it, uh, is it some vestige of, of sexism? Is it both? 
Um, and so I'm not certain that we've resolved it. And we won't know, of course, until about you know Thanksgiving when all this is settled. Um, but at the same time, I think um, it, 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 it's, it's a multi-pronged question um, and, 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 uh, and, and one that I think goes to the heart of the gendered nature of black politics. So uh, any other panelists wanna add to that? Because we also see this question also coming up in relationship to the broader conversation around the ways in which uh, Biden's response in the first debate uh, uh, around law and order and justice and the ways in which the scholars around uh, the panel may have read that as um, an inappropriate kind of connection between law and order and race. So thinking about what that means for uh, both Black voters overall, but then also these kinds of gender dynamics that we see within the Black vote. So maybe think about this in terms of broader BLM organizing, thinking about this in regards to the kind of um, BLM and other Black mobilizations, um, direct direct action protest, um, and you know this kind of idea of uh, law and order. So that's something. A few questions brought together. I'll go. I'm trying. I'm waiting. I'm like, girl, do you have your um, hand on the on the on mute? Go ahead. You go ahead. Oh well. Oh, I mean, it's a deep question because to what Todd said, you know, there are multiple layers here. And I think one of the things, particularly with the Biden, that initial response and then juxtaposed it with what he said a few days ago in his speech, I think it still speaks to this strategy of trying to find and attract these white voters who are gone and they ain't never coming back. And the Democrats have, they won't accept it. They won't accept that these folks have been gone for over 25, 30 years. They are gone for a reason, right? And so I think when we see those moments, you see a party that is still struggling to accept who they are and who their voters want them to be. Um, and so I think that is to the identity problem that white Democrats have, because black people are really clear about this is who, what we believe and what we expect of this party. Um, but I think from a research standpoint, this is a great opportunity to, re in, to reinvent or revigorate this, the field around political socialization, which has been dormant for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have to talk about the fact that when we're talking about black men and even young black people who are questioning Harris, we're talking about black people that are not tied to a party in the way that people in my age are. They were not socialized around party politics in the way that we were. Um, the media, the, all these different ways that they're being social. So I think there's a lot here to look at and we have an opportunity to what Dr. McCormick spoke to, to really shift our, our field and shift political science and how we understand how people are coming to politics. Um, but I think when we look at these Biden, but back to my point, when we look at these Biden here, I think we're still seeing that remnants, even though we want to see the party move towards us, those comments are saying that they are still slow to do that. And hopefully, you know, like Todd, I'm a, I'm a daughter of Howard and I'm excited about Kamala. Hopefully by Thanksgiving, we can see that maybe that didn't hurt the party, um, but it's something that they're still reckoning with. And unfortunately it's like, come on, hurry up and let's get, let's get there because this is where, if you want to win, you've got to move and you've got to let those folks go. Mm. Lori. As I noted in my opening comments, how we stand on so many, um, the shoulders of so many giants in, in, our, um, in the study of black politics, particularly black women who've been for the last 25 years or more, um, Wendy Smoove and others have been pushing us to um, position the interests of black women um, and to be able to um, look at the data across race and gender. And that's been a really long, hard fight. fight. Um, but I wonder about the extent to which the Democratic Party cares much about black men or the discipline of political science, because um, you'd be hard pressed to find a comprehensive study in one of our premier journals positioning the interests of black men. I also would like to know um, more about this 14 percent of black men who favored Trump in 2016 and the extent to which public policy issues like immigration, um, like uh, employment and education 
um, and and um, law and order broadly defined, right? Weaponized even as in, in terms of its, in terms of its language, um, but the extent to which um, Trump's overtures to the black community and partnerships with folks um, who, um, about around um, um, incarceration and the carceral state has had an impact. And are we? What do we lose as a discipline? if we don't try to understand the impact of um, these policy initiatives, whether they're overtures or something that has an impact, that's an empirical question on the black male electorate. And, and I also wonder about the extent to which they themselves feel it. They themselves feel alienated from the process. Um, so you know, these are just questions that I raise and Todd, I just want to say to you, my mentor, that I um, I appreciate your presentation and I appreciate the conversations that we've had. And I hope that these conversations will continue unapologetically because um, Black women and Black men, we can often get, um, when we begin to have these conversations, as defensive as white women are when we question the extent to which the loyalty of the, to the Republican Party and then Black women's loyalty to the Democratic Party. So these kinds of conversations are difficult to have, um, but they're worthy. We are worthy to have and engage um, within our own communities and across communities. So I guess I'm just raising more points than answering them, but we'd be hard pressed and we can do better as a discipline. If you wanna answer these questions before the election cycle to try to understand the large percentages of black men, um, not just for Trump, but ask somebody 60 and over in your family if they voted for Reagan and, and Bush number one, right? And you might be surprised about the answer that's not talked about in Thanksgiving or Christmas. And as you, and to your point and not talked about um, in our data and um, the ways in which we collect um, and ask and formulate the questions, which is why it's so critically important um, around the work that you're leading um, to help us ask our questions differently. One thing I wanna uplift, there've been several uh, questions and inquiries about the slides and whether or not they will be posted. Um, more to come in that regard, we wanna make sure that we are protecting the intellectual property of these amazing scholars, um, but we will also uh, further in knowledge building and knowledge production and so those slides will, uh, we're working towards getting those slides um, available to you, um, but we will also be working towards making sure they are appropriately copywritten. Um, we want an um, opportunity to continue. So you all continue to place uh, questions um, in the q and I think we could probably, uh, Tiffany, get one additional question in before we close it out. We have certainly uh, rattled many corners, including um, calling into question, what are our, what is our role um, as an academic discipline, which are questions that we certainly appreciate for how we grow um, the discipline and the relevance um, of political political science uh, overall, and certainly a, a huge research trajectory coming out of just this webinar alone. Tiffany, I turn it to you. Thank you, Wendy. There's a question from Diane Penderhughes. Dr. Penderhughes wrote, voting in a pandemic, but there's also the question of campaigning in a pandemic. Maya Wiley declaring her candidacy for New York City mayor today, and I thought, wow, she's got to campaign. And then she also listed her announcement there. So thoughts that any of you all have about what it means to actually be campaigning at this moment? Pearl, I'm gonna look to your work on, on political <laughs> ambition. Um, because I, I do know that, you know, oftentimes the shortcomings of black women being able to run a successful campaign means that they need donors and they need the capacity to run and run well. And some of the differences between um, women of color running versus white, white men running for election. And, I, and you know, this was news to me, that, um, Diane, that you shared about Maya Wiley. And I'm wondering that you know, within this um, pandemic space where we're utilizing a virtual space um, more readily, will it hurt or harm um, in terms of some of the shortcomings of running a successful electoral campaign around fundraising, around um, you know getting out the name recognition. And again, this is uncharted territory, not just at the presidential level, but at state and local races about the impact that this, um, this medium is going to have 
on black women and women of color um, seeking elective office. So again, this is an uncharted terrain, but I do know that the question for me is the extent to which um, this, this space and, um, and, and fundraising and kinds of other things that are so pivotal to being successful. How will these candidates, women of color, parse this space um, of, of campaigning and fundraising? Will it help or, or will it harm? And I don't have the answer to that. Maybe Pearl and, and Wendy, you might have more to say. I don't, I don't have the answer to that, but I will say the fundraising piece is quite interesting. So I interviewed over 25 Black women from across the country, all the way from Alaska, Maine, Michigan, all throughout the South, various levels, school board in California. The, the amount of money, and we oftentimes talk about the congressional races. When I'm talking, I had talked to some women that ran for a school, a, a local city council, and they were raising $50,000, $60,000, and these are small little suburban towns. And so to Lori's point, when we talk about fundraising, what is needed for these women to win a school board position or city council, when we get to the state level, and what these women were really clear about was that they understood the rules were very different for them. They talked about working rooms with white women and they knew that the same white person that was gonna give them $300, was gonna give this other person $500. So they were very conscious of that. But I think one of the things that the research also shows, and Wendy has researched this, Black women are extremely strategic, right? And so I think that we're going to see some very innovative ways that Black women are going to find to, um, to come together to fundraise. One of the things I mentioned, the Reynoldsburg women, they ran as a slate. And that was just amazing to me how they came together to pool their resources um, in this white suburb in Ohio to win. Um, and so I, I think we're going to see a lot of strategies around when these women announce. That's also very important that I, that these women talked about when they announced was important because they knew that when they announced that a black woman was going to run, here comes, you know, trying to get a bunch of black men to run against them. That was also a strategy that they were acknowledging was happening in some of these communities. So I think we're going to see um, just amazing strategies from women and just new ways. And I think black women are gonna lead the way um, in how women overall begin to look at some of these issues. Um, and then I'm, I'm encouraged because even with women with name recognition, I'm thinking about um, in Florida with Val Deming, she raised so much money last quarter, she gave money back, she gave money to the DNC, to the DCC. So you have these women that have this major fundraising chops um, that we don't talk about. Um, so hopefully, you know, to your point, Lori, it is going to be a problem, but hopefully Black women being Black women will find ways to um, overcome in this moment. So we are amazingly up against time, um, but what a generative conversation, what an engaging um, set of research questions. I want to plug two additional places where this conversation can continue. One, um, every spring, and we have already announced uh, this spring, we will be virtual. The National Conference of Black Political Scientists hosts an annual meeting where these questions are at the center of multiple days of conversation that spill into the hallways and spill into the byways, but we will figure out how to do that um, all virtually. Um, and you too can experience the scholarly family uh, that uh, Todd Shaw uh, referenced as one of our former presidents. I also want to plug that the uh, proposal uh, portal is open now for the American Political Sciences Association, another space for this conversation to continue. Um, the uh, theme is around pluralism and one of uh, the INCOPE's members, uh, Valeria Sinclair Chapman, is one of the co, um, uh, co what do we call ourselves, our co-host um, of the, um, the program, chairs, sorry, my mind went off for a moment. So those are wonderful opportunities for us all to continue the conversation. For those of you who are teaching um, this semester, we hope that you will bring this conversation and others around the importance of race and gender and other elements of identity into our conversations on voting. 
Um, I want to again thank the presidents of these organizations, NCOPES and APSA, um, who uh, excitedly joined in to the proposition by a group of Black women political scientists who were fired up about what our voices as political scientists would mean to the election cycle. So let's keep these conversations going. Let's teach, let's research, um, and let's keep each other encouraged in the days ahead. Um, thank you all and look out for the recording, the availability of the recording um, and the slides. Join us all again. Help me thank my amazing co-moderator, Tiffany Willoughby Harad, president-elect of NCOPES, um, and all of our amazing uh, panelists. Thank you so much for your time. Um, everyone have a wonderful uh, afternoon. Thank you.